The Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 20, through chapter 7, verse 35. Messiah teaches how to please God. We are still in the fourth section of the book, Jesus' Mission, Messiah's Message and Work. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles. What is the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Let's look at some of the terms that Luke employs for Christians in the Gospel and in the Book of Acts. In alphabetical order, apostles are those who have Jesus' delegated authority. You cannot designate yourself an apostle. Believers are those who have faith in Jesus. Brethren are believers who love one another. They form a community. Pagans called them Christians, that is, little messiahs. Collectively, they were known as the gathering, or in English, churches. Christians form communities. Disciples are any who follow Jesus' teaching. Some disciples are called elders. These are mature Christians who serve as models of good behavior. And they are saints, that is, they belong to God. They are his holy people. Notice the location of Tyre and Sidon. In the province of Syria, this was traditionally Gentile territory. By the first century, these populations had adopted Greek language and culture. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. These had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. Messiah was present with them. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. And blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. The term blessed according to the lexicons, can be translated fortunate, happy, favored, or privileged. Some will ask, how is it a blessing to be destitute, poor, malnourished, hungry, emotionally crushed? No, it is not a blessing to be any of those. So, discuss together, why did Jesus say so? Well, part of the answer may be this. First, blessed applies only to Jesus' disciples. And secondly, they will be happy in a far future. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of me, the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Yes, followers of Jesus can be maltreated, just as were the prophets of old. Undeserved persecution, however, earns for you a great reward, which is being stored for you in the heavens, and will be revealed when Jesus shall return. But love your enemies, do good for them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Jesus is now teaching to the larger crowd, amongst whom were many lenders who exploited the poor. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. 
Yes, God wants us to treat others in the way that he does. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Not judged by whom? Not condemned by whom? Forgive and you will be forgiven. By whom? Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, running over, will be poured into your lap, that is, the flap of your garment. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Yes, forever, God will treat you in the manner that you treated others, even though they be unjust or evil. So, does this mean that we have no moral standards? Or must not distinguish right from wrong? Are we to excuse others' sins? Well, who have a right and duty to judge and to condemn, if not you and I? Well, obviously, God, the Creator, if you live in a constitutional republic, then you can be judged by a jury of peers, but never by government. So, whom was Jesus chiding in this manner? Certainly, religious bigots who were judging him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. Lord, Lord refers to those who go about calling Jesus their Lord. But before we do so, here's what Jesus requires. He has said, come to me. So we believe in Jesus for everlasting life. And he receives us. Thank you, Jesus. Then hear my words, that is, read, study, remember my teaching, my promises, and my commandments and put them into practice. Believe my teaching, claim my promises, and obey my commandments. Then, go tell others that I am your Lord. I will guide you and provide for you, now and forever. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Now, we can infer a number of things about this particular centurion. A Roman military officer, he was responsible to train, command, and to discipline between 60 and 80 soldiers. He was probably not Roman, more likely a member of the Syrian auxiliary who were stationed in Judea. Apparently, he had retired to his own home in Capernaum, having completed 30 years of service. He was well enough paid that he could afford to purchase and to keep intelligent, skilled servants. We know that he believed in Israel's God, but was not a convert to Judaism. Thus, both his house and his food were likely considered to be unclean. But he definitely exercised and respected authority. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. 
That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, Go, and he goes, and to that one, Come, and he comes. I say to my servant, Do this, and he does it. Authority is any ability to elicit obedience in others. We believe that God possesses absolute authority. As creator, he can make anything happen. However, ever since the time our first parents disobeyed God by obeying the devil, devils now exercise usurped authority over us. We humans ourselves, we only employ coercive authority over each other. Then our state legitimizes that human authority. Of course, all societies teach respect for authority, even though criminals are those who resist state authority. By the way, clergy have responsibilities. They do not have authority. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So, what does real faith believe? In this context, faith believes that Jesus Christ has all authority to heal, even from a distance. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nan, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. The only son of a mother, and she was a widow and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went and touched the bear they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. A word about resurrection of the dead. God wants a family of angels and of humans. He had that in Eden until the humans and devils fell into sin. Since then, all humans commit sins and all die. Even so, God promised that humans will live again. To prove this, both Jesus and his apostles revived some dead folk. But after Jesus died, he rose victorious over death. And he has promised that he will raise his followers from death upon his return. We will then live with him forever in a new Eden, the new heaven and the new earth. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, said they. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Notice the two steps to faith in Jesus. First, the recognition that Jesus was a great prophet. But more than that, he was God who visited his people. Discuss together what truths will you affirm from this passage? What promises will you claim? What commands will you obey? Your assignment for next time is to read carefully Gospel of Luke 7.36 to 8.25. Visit the website to download other sources. Whilst you read, please compile your own insights, queries, and observations to share with others.